There have been a lot of weird WrestleManias. WrestleMania 9, for example, WrestleMania 2, WrestleMania 11 with its celebrity headliner, uh, WrestleMania 9, of course, WrestleMania 31 for defying expectations in the best possible way, WrestleMania 39 for ending in kind of the worst possible way, uh, WrestleMania 9, and of course, WrestleMania 9. But all of these examples pale in comparison to the 2020 edition of WWE's biggest annual showcase. That's right, WrestleMania 36 was even weirder than WrestleMania 9. And that, I don't know if I mentioned that one, that one was pretty weird. And there's multiple reasons for this. WrestleMania 36 was the first uh, WrestleMania to take place across two consecutive days. It was also the first WrestleMania to air on tape delay rather than live. The matches actually took place about a week before the show itself actually went on the network. Uh, but of course, the biggest reason that WrestleMania 36 is the weirdest WrestleMania ever is because it was the lockdown WrestleMania. Yes, that's right. Instead of taking the maybe more logical step of delaying WrestleMania until a more appropriate later date, WWE plowed ahead and held their biggest show of the year in an empty performance center. I think enough time has passed now in the past four years where, yes, we might remember the main events or big shocking match results or whatever, but there's a lot of stuff having watched this show back that I completely forgot about. If you're anything like me, I think you might enjoy this bumper length edition of Weirdest Episodes as a little bit of a strange look back at one of the biggest curiosities, one of the biggest oddities in WWE pay-per-view history. Uh, and if you're maybe a newer fan of wrestling or you're unfamiliar with what happened, you're in for a very bizarre time. I'm Jack from Coldaholic and this is Weirdest Episodes. Hit that intro, Luke. Yeah, as I mentioned, this one, because it took place on two nights, is going to be longer than the usual episodes of Weirdest Episodes. So let's waste no further time and dive straight in with night number one. It's April 2020, the world is in the process of ending, and here to save the day is WWE. And who better to welcome us to the show than our guiding light in these dark times, our guardian angel, Stephanie McMahon. Remember her? Steph says every WrestleMania has its own personality, every mania is different, and this one will be no exception. And she's not wrong. She also says, the, in quite self-aggrandizing fashion. The WWE is here to offer a message of hope, persistence, resilience, and all that sort of stuff. So let's all just take a lesson from that. Let's remember that when we see Rob Gronkowski on our screens in a few moments time, because no matter how dark we might have been feeling in 2020, if we just push through and persevere and show resilience, we too could one day become 24 seven champion. Now we throw to a video package, kind of a montage of previous editions of people singing America the Beautiful, which traditionally opened opens WrestleMania from sea to shining sea. And then we're into, remember that pirate hype video? In case you don't remember, WrestleMania 36 was gonna take place in Tampa, Florida, and therefore it was gonna have a pirate theme, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers and all of that. When that got canceled, we were deprived of the pirate ship part of the set, which thankfully appeared the following year at WrestleMania 37. But in 2020, WWE just kept the theme anyway. It's got a narrator who's like, uh, you might remember this, like a sarcastic Jack Sparrow impersonator. Sorry, Captain Jack Sparrow, of course. But even though he's meant to be doing Jack Sparrow, I think he comes across a little bit kind of like the character Wheatley from Portal 2. Sick gaming reference, Jack. Yes, come on. I'm one of you guys now. Finally, with all the hype packages and everything all out the way, it's time to begin the show properly. Ooh, I'm blinded by the light. That's the theme tune. And then we're straight into, as I mentioned, Gronk, Rob Gronkowski, here to be our host of WrestleMania. And it goes without saying, he's a bit excited to be here. He's up on the platform. He gives what I would describe as quite a terrified monologue. He, he, he struggles through it, but bless him, he's doing his best. And then he's joined by his good friend, Mojo Rawley, who's so hyped for the show that he gets Gronk to chop him four times, in fact, and he no-sells each and every chop. I can only assume they had a furious argument once the camera stopped rolling. The first match is for the women's tag team titles. It's Alexa Bliss and Nikki Cross challenging the champions, the Kabuki Warriors, who, interestingly, at the the time of recording are once again women's tag team champions, despite Kyrie Sane having since left and then rejoined WWE. Time is so weird. Bliss and Cross are the classic odd couple tag team. One of them's mean, the other one's crazy. How are they gonna get along? 
Up in the balcony, Mojo and Gronk are like, woo, yeah, women, come on. Well, I don't think that's what they're going for, but it's almost sort of how it comes across. And the story early on here is that the champions are not taking the challenges seriously at all. They're dancing for ages before the opening bell. Kyrie messes with Bliss's hair. They're being very cocky. And while they're healing it up and talking a lot of trash to each other and that sort of stuff, it reminds me that without a crowd, wrestling suddenly becomes a lot more childlike, a lot more pantomime -y. They're not really saying full sentences or even sometimes real words, kind of just making noises, going like, oh, grrr. Oh, and you could argue that this is a bad thing because it's too silly or too childish, but again, wrestling is for children sometimes. And I think it's got a certain charm to it as well. Like, this is the very root, the very fabric of professional wrestling, heroes versus villains. And if the silly noises enhance that, then so be it. There's not much to report in terms of the action early on. It's the traditional match format. The heels are dominating and the baby faces are bravely making their comeback. Eventually though, we do get our first botch of the evening. Yes, come on, that's for you, Matthew. Uh, it's not a big one. It's just that Nikki kind of accidentally throws Kyrie into a ringside camera and she clonks her head. Looks quite nasty. I think she's okay, but I don't think it was deliberate because she kind of has to no sell it and hit a, a nice head scissors from the guardrail. But it was still a botch, wasn't it? Botchomania. Yes. Nikki gets isolated by the champions and beaten down for a while. Hot tag to Bliss. She gets isolated and beaten down for a while. Hot tag to Nikki, who doesn't get beaten down this time. And now the challengers are picking up ahead of steam. In fact, Nikki is so fired up that she does her version of pulling the straps down, which is kind of politely unzipping her ring jacket. Like, I know she's meant to be crazy. I think that's actually a far more sensible way of firing up than the pulling down of the straps. I would like to see a wrestler maybe fire up by lightly adjusting their shirt sleeves or maybe tightening their tie. We maybe got that, didn't we, with right to censor, so that's, that's a stupid point, Jack. Nikki almost gets the win at one point, but Kyrie Sane breaks up the pinfall attempt with her always excellent elbow drop from the top rope. Uh, you could argue that maybe she's like a millisecond too late and the ref has to kind of hesitate in his count, but that's really clutching at straws. That's not one for Botchamania. Botchamania. Uh, Matthew's my shoot legitimate friend in real life. I don't know why I'm doing this. Everybody hits their signature moves on each other and takes a bit of a breather on the canvas. When they all get back to their feet though, the champions hit a modified doomsday device on Nikki Cross. This is 987 Jim Crockett stuff. This is all Japan in the early 90s. This is, this is, this is, this is wrestling. Nikki survives though. She hits her finisher on Kyrie Sane, tags Bliss, who hits Twisted Bliss, and we have new women's tag team champions. And I actually remember this result because when we did our predictions contest for WrestleMania 36 here at Cultaholic, I remember that myself and Ross had exactly the same predictions for every match apart from this one. And because this was the first match and because the challengers won, I remember thinking, yes, I've beaten Ross now, no matter what happens for the rest of the two nights, I'm gonna finish ahead of him in the predictions and maybe, maybe I could even win. Neither of us ended up winning and it was a total waste of time. And even the fact that I've remembered that makes me feel like I'm a really deeply quite sad individual. In a backstage interview now, we get, remember this little mini stable, the Artist Collective, Sami Zayn, Cesaro and Shinsuke Nakamura. I remember them. I remember not liking them. And I'll explain why I didn't like the Artist Collective. I just thought they didn't really make sense. Like, Nakamura had been the IC champion previously, then he'd lost the belt to Braun Strowman, and then all three of them were in a handicap match against Strowman where they let Sami Zayn get the pin, and now he's the new IC champion. So Nakamura went from being the IC champion to just quite happily being the lackey, the henchman to the IC champion. And there was never any, as far as I can remember, never any tension because of this. They, it was kind of lazy storytelling in my, in my respected opinion. So yeah, Shinsuke was just fine with it. And I thought that made them a really pathetic stable. In fact, from now on, let's just call them the Pathetic Boys. That's a good name for them. The, the Pathetic Boys is good, I will admit. Anyway, the point of the interview is that Sami Zayn is not worried about defending the belt later on tonight against Daniel Bryan of all people, because the Pathetic Boys always have a plan. He'll be walking out of WrestleMania still the IC champion. The interview ends and we are on to our second match of the evening, Baron Corbin, or King Corbin, excuse me, versus Elias. Corbin comes out first, gets on the mic and reminds us that basically, wait, why is he using a mic? It's, there's nobody, 
Okay. But anyway, Corbin reminds us that uh, this match probably isn't even going to take place because a couple of weeks ago, and he shows footage of this on the Tron, uh, Elias got knocked off the platform, the Gronk balcony, by Corbin and landed on the concrete below. We didn't see the landing, but I trust WWE. I think that was a real bump. Corbin wants the referee to raise his hand, count out Elias, and declare him the winner of the match by forfeit. Uh, he says all this into the microphone, then off mic, for some reason, because on the mic he's been all macho and raw, and then off mic he goes, do your job, raise my hand. <laughs> That's really strange. But Corbin is interrupted by Elias, who saunters out with the guitar. He's made it to WrestleMania, yes. Corbin goes to meet him on the ramp. Elias smashes the guitar over his back. Elias begins the match in the ring in control because of this guitar shot, but then Corbin fights back. Elias is obviously weakened from the previous attack the other week, and uh, Corbin's in control. He then shouts at the commentary team to tell everyone at home how good I am. And we get, and I'm not exaggerating, we get like a slow comedy pan from Corbin in the ring across to Cole and JBL, who don't say anything. They react like they've never been spoken to in English before. <laughs> like they're really confused. Tell you someone who isn't confused though, the referee, because Corbin tries a dirty pinfall with his feet on the ropes. She catches him and says, no, no, you can't do that. And Corbin genuinely goes, Nya! However, he's distracted himself. Elias grabs a roll up with a handful of tights. The ref doesn't see that one. And Elias wins the match. I mean, it, it might not be the glorious sort of revenge you'd expect from a man whose opponent had literally tried to murder him a couple of weeks ago, but hey, a win's a win, especially on the grandest stage of them all. Next up, right, things are about to get weird now. Um, not like wacky weird, but like like bad weird. It's Becky Lynch versus Shayna Baszler for the Raw Women's Championship. Becky is defending. Shayna qualified for this match by winning the Elimination Chamber. Becky gets a special WrestleMania entrance. She arrives in a big truck with flames on it. Oh yeah, but uh, it's not it's not quite as good as if she was pulling into like a, a packed out big stadium. Uh, this is actually more a case of she just parks it up in the in the car park and then walks into the building. Both women get in the ring. It's a big fight to start. Oh, they're swinging. Oh, they're swinging. <laughs> I got really excited there. This is an intense one to start off with. They're both avoiding each other's finishing maneuvers. They're brawling on the outside. They're getting out of submissions. Becky at one stage hits the manhandle slam on the apron, which looks really brutal. Shayna though fights back and starts to dominate. Big knee to the face. She swings Becky into the side of the announce table on the outside. Back inside, she avoids the disarmor and locks in the Kirifuda clutch. Surely this is it, right? But then Becky rolls backwards uh, quite easily, pins Shayna's shoulders to the mat. One, two, three. Um, Becky retains. Oh. Now, if you don't really know the story behind the, the background to this match or the build to it, you might be thinking, Jack, what's the problem? Like, it sounds like it was a good match, and it was best match of the night so far. Also, though, clearly by far the worst booking decision as well. And on the surface, it might not seem like a weird booking decision. You know, Becky's the champion. She's the biggest star of the women's division by a mile. She won the main event of the previous year's WrestleMania. It all looks good. But let's all remember that Shayna Baszler was only really recently, like a month prior, being built up as the next big thing of the women's division. I mean, she won that Elimination Chamber match to get this title shot like nobody else really has before. She she didn't just win the Chamber, she eliminated every single other one of the entrants in the match, all via submission, or technical submission as well. And then she gets to her big title match and loses to Becky via a reversal, a, a kind of a, a pinning predicament, a roll-up. It, it doesn't really make any sense at all. And you could even argue that Shayna's momentum has never fully recovered four years later. It was later reported by Dave Meltzer that apparently Becky Lynch herself had even pitched, even suggested dropping the title to Shayna because she knew that herself and Seth Rollins were trying for a baby and hopefully that meant she would have to take time off soon. So it didn't make sense for her to keep the belt in this situation. Also, uh, it, it, why build up Shayna so much? But apparently, and this is again via Dave Meltzer, apparently Vince McMahon cancelled Shayna's push because he just didn't believe in her MMA style or wasn't a fan of her MMA style in the ring. Night 2, by the way, headlined by Brock Lesnar. So, I mean, what's going on? It's such a weird and sad 180 by, <laughs> by a weird and, and sad individual. Anyway, moving on, next up, we've got Sami Zayn defending that icy title against Brian... Brian... Brian, Brian Daniels... Daniel... Bra against that bloke. Brian comes out with his sidekick, Drew Gulak. Remember that little weird period of time? Remember that? Sammy spends a lot of time stalling on the outside in heelish fashion, trying to frustrate Brian in the ring. Cesaro shouts from the outside, he's getting tired already, which is funny considering there's been zero moves exchanged so far. 
Brian then gets sick of waiting. He gets out the ring, tries to chase Sammy around several times. But Cesaro and Nakamura keep standing in his way. Uh, Drew eventually gets sick of this and takes them both out. Drew Gulak battering both of these blokes on his own. And I think they're higher than him generally in the pecking order. Like if they were all on the same WWE 2K roster, he would have the lowest rating. But he deals with them handily and knocks them over the barricade. Sammy thinks, right, let's try a different tactic. And he just decides to take a count out loss to protect his title reign. But Brian tackles him on the ramp and starts beating him down. And then for the next few minutes, the action is pretty much dominated by Daniel Bryan. There are submission attempts, kicks to the chest, a uh, dive to the outside. Brian is fully on top of things until Nakamura and Cesaro get back from the other side of the crowd barricade and beat Drew Gulak down on the outside. Brian charges, takes out the two henchmen with a nice dive to the outside, gets up on the top rope, jumps back in, uh, Sammy hits him with a halluva kick in midair, and that's it. Sammy pins him. Hmm, that's that's one of the that's one of the greatest of all time. And what I mean by that is like, right, if this was a match on Raw or whatever, fair enough. Like, it's a good it's a good enough TV match. But this is WrestleMania, and I know there's no crowd there or anything. But like, you've got a match, a title match between arguably like one of the greatest wrestlers of all time, right? And then Sami Zayn, who is considered by many to be at least a modern great, if not more. But if we take all the stalling and everything at the start of the match into account, it really adds up to about five minutes of actual wrestling, if that. Really bizarre. Anyway, Sammy holds on to his belt, and that, yeah, that's it. Um, the next match is an odd stipulation. That's because, right, it's for the SmackDown Tag Team titles, okay? Uh, but it's a triple threat ladder match, not a three-team ladder match, just a triple threat ladder match between three singles guys. So one half of each of the teams involved doesn't even factor into things. So that brings us on to something we'll revisit a couple of times in this video and something that had quite a big impact on this WrestleMania card, replacements. Various superstars couldn't compete uh, at WrestleMania 36 for various different reasons. Uh, and the first one we have to mention is one half of the tag team champions, The Miz, who missed out due to a reported illness. So in order for his partner, John Morrison, to still be able to defend the belts, Jey Uso and Big E also missed out, meaning that it was just Jimmy, uh, John, and Kofi. Jimmy, John, and Kofi. Just the boys having a, gra having a, having a lovely little time with some ladders. They all get the ladders involved early on, and I get excited, like, oh, we're gonna see some ladder action. And we do see some ladder-based action later on, but it kind of hinders the opening stages of the match, because there's ladders everywhere in the ring, but they're still trying to wrestle kind of a normal triple threat around them and doing all moves and stuff. And it, it looks like a very difficult environment to do your job in. I'd find this video difficult if there were just ladders about, and I'm not even really moving. Doing a bit of this, but that's about it. I can see myself in the the, the the screen on the camera, I just, I, I wasn't happy about how that, how that went down. I thought I could have been more dynamic, maybe. We get a comedy spot at one point where Jimmy Uso tries to push a ladder onto John Morrison, but it falls, Morrison gets lucky, it falls like around him and his body is in the gap in the middle of the ladder. And then he pops up and just pokes Jimmy in the eyes. And because there's been a poke in the eyes, Michael Cole on commentary reminds us, there is no DQ in this match. Nice one, Michael, yeah, I know that, Michael. Michael Morrison hits a really nice corkscrew from the ring post onto a ladder bridge which is wedged between the ropes upon which Jimmy Uso is laying. Upon which, very Shakespearean from me there, forsooth. We get more and more high risk spots as the match develops. John Morrison at one stage does a very impressive tightrope from one corner of the ring to the other into a Spanish fly back into the ring. A really nice move, but also inherently pointless. And that's okay. Now we get a bit of lockdown era trickery, guys. Uh, call me Angela Lansbury, because I've spotted something a little bit suspicious. John Morrison pushes Jimmy Uso off a ladder all the way to the floor down on the outside. A terrifying bump, but hang on, because just like Elias previously, we don't see Jimmy land. And then when the camera finally does reveal Jimmy, his body is pointing in the opposite direction to that which he left the ladder pointing in. So it's almost as if they had some sort of crash mat or padding device there, which they then sneakily removed before the next shot. I don't know. It's just, I'm such a, I'm such a killjoy. I, I'm genuinely disappointed in myself. I wouldn't expect Jimmy to take that bump. No sane person would want to take that bump. I am recording this recently, like a few, like a week or so since Darby Allen actually did that, but worse, through a pane of glass off a bigger ladder. So some people would do that. 
The end of the match comes when all three men end up atop different ladders and they all pull down the, the hook, the structure that has the belts attached to it, but they pull it down at the same time. They've all got hold of it. Who's gonna, who's gonna win the match? It's John Morrison who gets knocked down onto a ladder bridge below, which looks really painful, but it's a worthwhile pain, John, because he manages to grab both the belts as he falls and that kind of makes him the winner. Well, it does make him the winner. It was never really made clear in the rules what would happen if that was the case, but the bell rings and his music plays. John Martha. I'm doing that again. I can see myself in the camera doing it again. Next up, a singles match between Seth Rollins and Kevin Owens, a feud built around the fact that Kevin Owens is still searching for and is yet to really have a big WrestleMania moment. Rollins is in his heel persona here, the Monday Night Messiah, and in the hype package, we see that he's been bragging to Kevin, saying, you've not had a WrestleMania moment. I've had so many, I'm really good when it's WrestleMania. Like, he cashed in at the end of WrestleMania 31, he beat Triple H at WrestleMania 33. Owens hasn't really had that yet, unless you count sharing the ring and losing to a team involving Shane McMahon, which Kevin Owens did do at WrestleMania 34. So he, he's got that, you know? The match begins and Kev is in control early on because he is the angrier of the two and that's how fighting works. Seth though assumes control of the bout with a really gnarly falcon arrow on the apron, ouch. Kevin Owens loves apron bumps, doesn't he? Giving them and receiving them. It's the hardest part of the ri- I, He needs to sort out his priorities. Bit of Ron Weasley there from me. Uh, we get a lot of trash talk from Seth throughout this match, by the way. But it's like that weird WWE branded trash talk. Like, instead of saying, F you, I'm gonna batter you, mate, which wouldn't go down too well. It is that WWE branded trash talk. It goes too far the other way, where Seth's saying, like, you thought you were gonna be the one to burn it down at WrestleMania, Kevin? because you gotta get the catchphrases in there, man. We get a few reversals down the stretch, both men avoiding each other's signature moves, like Owens avoids the stomp, Rollins counters the stunner attempt, but Owens does get a very near pinfall off the pop-up powerbomb, which I've mimed helpfully for you there. That's what it looks like, yeah? Rollins doesn't like the way that this match is panning out, and the next time the action spills to the outside, he takes the cheap way out, clocking Owens with the ring bell and depriving him of a big WrestleMania moment. Uh, the ref goes, ring the bell, and Rollins has to sort of hand it to the, like the timekeeper stood there looking and probably feeling a little bit awkward. I would have as well. Rollins goes to leave and Owens, exhausted but still battling bravely, gets on the microphone and says, no Seth, it's not going down like that. And he successfully provokes Rollins into restarting the match under a no DQ stipulation. You might think, why would Seth agree to that? This isn't a good idea for him. I'll tell you why he agreed to it, because Owens provoked him by calling him the one thing you do not call another WWE superstar. Star. That's right. He called him a little bitch. Oh, little bitch. <laughs> I freaked myself out big time. I'm so sorry. Seth is in control straight away, beating Owens down with the ring steps and a steel chair, but then Owens fights back by clocking him with the ring bell. The very same ring bell that Seth used on him before. It's drama, it's poetry, it's literature. Seth is laid out on the announce table. Owens scales all the way to the top of the WrestleMania sign and leaps off with a genuinely terrifying senton, which connects and looks awesome. It's actually way more scary than I remembered it being four years ago, and I don't know why I would have thought it wasn't scary. I, you know, it, I was like, wow, hang on. I don't remember it being that terrifying, but it really was, and he nailed it, so fair play. Back in the ring, Seth uh, does the only option still available to him. Uh, he begs for mercy, like a little bitch. Uh, Owens obviously says no, Stunner, one, two, three, and Owens gets not only the win, but a WrestleMania moment. And Tom Phillips on commentary hammers this home by helpfully explaining to us that Kevin Owens has burned it down at WrestleMania. Thank you, Tom. Cheers, man. And indeed, this would live on as Kevin Owens' finest WrestleMania moment ever. Not main eventing against Stone Cold Steve Austin two years later, and not winning the tag titles in that huge main event alongside Sami Zayn in 2023. No, no, this, when he burned it down. This was his biggest one, yeah? Hey, uh, that was a pretty exciting end to the match. And I'll tell you who else was excited by it. Up in the balcony, it's, it's bloody Gronk and Mojo, isn't it? Oh, I hate fun. 24-7 uh, champion our truth interrupts and helpfully for us goes, hello guys, I'm our truth uh, Thank you, Truth. And we're, we're all aware. Truth says, and I quote, uh, he is so paranoid about being 24-7 champion. He can't even enjoy his life. He can't even go to picnics or church, which I think probably are the two, are the two things we all most enjoy, aren't they? Picnics and church. 
Oh, picnics and church. <laughs> sounds like sounds like the world's tamest rap duo. Truth asks Gronk and Mojo to please keep things quiet, keep it down, so that nobody knows that he's here with the 24/7 title, which he has to defend. 24-7, obviously, it's it's in the name. Um, Truth says all of this and begs them to be quiet while speaking directly into a microphone. I want to include that as like a weird thing on this episode, like a silly accident, but it's our Truth who's kind of immune to any of that because his character just does wacky things. So I can't, I'm really frustrated. I can't quite criticize them for that. Now Gronk thinks actually, you know what? I quite fancy winning that belt and he hits Truth with a Devastating four. Oh no. Luke, can you find a good screenshot of Gronk doing this? It's like a, like look at that. And the lean is crazy. Now look, let's make no mistake about it. Rob Gronkowski would eat me alive if he wanted to. He's like six foot five, probably a legitimate 250 plus pounds. So I was even more surprised to see him throwing strikes from the Jenna Maraska school of wrestling. Gronk makes the cover. But Mojo, his best friend in the whole world, apart from Tom Brady, drags him off and makes the cover himself to become 24-7 champion. Oh, Mojo, you've ruined the party. Next up, a backstage interview with Paul Heyman, who is hyping a match on night two. The main event, in fact. He says there is no way that Drew McIntyre is going to beat Brock Lesnar because uh, Drew is, and I quote, a big bitch wannabe. Oh, Paul, that's so catty. Oh, now we've reached the penultimate match of night one of WrestleMania 36, the match that was originally supposed to be Goldberg versus Roman Reigns, but Roman missed out on this year's WrestleMania, understandably so, because of his medical history. So instead we get Goldberg defending the Universal Championship against Braun Strowman. Now, I don't have any problems with Braun Strowman uh, replacing Roman Reigns here. Fair play to him, in fact, for stepping up at such short notice. But how on earth did Goldberg become Universal Champion again in 2020? Now then. So after a bit of an up and down start to its life, the Universal Championship, a couple of years in, became like maybe the worst belt in WWE? I think the Universal Championship curse really began when it was defended in what is the consensus worst Hell in a Cell match of all time in 2019 between Seth Rollins and The Fiend, uh, a match which ended in a DQ in Hell in a Cell and almost killed Brian Alvarez. Then the curse continued because after beating Seth for it in Saudi Arabia, Wyatt or The Fiend would then go on to lose it to Goldberg um, in a match and a result that not many people enjoyed. People hated that Wyatt lost to Goldberg, and not just because of that result itself, but because it was really similar to what Goldberg had done a couple of years previous. Because just like he did with Wyatt, back in 2017, Goldberg came in and also beat a younger, more relevant, up-and-coming competitor in WWE, someone the fans really wanted to see succeed, and that man was Kevin Owens. And in beating him for the Universal title, Goldberg didn't just kind of ruin Owens' momentum, but he really diluted the feud between Owens and Jericho, which should have been massive at that year's WrestleMania. It should have been for the Universal Championship, and it suffered because it wasn't. In fairness, the fans kind of ended up forgiving Goldberg for this, because he would drop the belt at WrestleMania 33 in a really nice little match with Brock Lesnar, which was probably one of the best matches of the whole show. But the question here going into this match at Mania 36 was, could Goldberg do that again? Could he win the fans' forgiveness for taking the belt off Wyatt in this match against Strowman? And the answer is, maybe, like a bit, sort of. Not really. Yeah, a little bit. It's a really forgettable match, but like, it's fine, I suppose. Like, I don't really know what to say about it. Strowman comes out first. Goldberg gets his big, usual Goldberg entrance with the security and coming out the locker room door and walking through the corridors. It's a bit different because it's obviously in the performance center and there's it's like empty and deserted, but I didn't hate it. I thought it was quite a nice little change of, of atmosphere. And then the match begins. Goldberg hits four spears. Strowman survives, hits four power slams and becomes universal champion. And that's it. That's the match. I don't know what I'm going to say now. Like, that's the wrestling match. That is the wrestling. Strowman would then feud with Bray, who would win the belt back, and then both of them would continue feuding, and then their feud would be gate-crashed, interrupted by Roman Reigns, who would win the belt, and just never lose, like, never lose it. This could be, this video could be the last weirdest episode where Roman is still the, the double champion, the unified, undisputed universal WWE, all that sort of stuff, when he's the big champion, he could have lost it by the next episode. Isn't that exciting? Cody can finish the story. I'm really scared that Cody's not gonna finish the story. I don't know what I'll do if he doesn't finish the story this time. Anyway, Strowman wins the belt. Uh, it's, the last, it's the last traditional wrestling match of the night, but it's not the last match of the night because it's time to go to the Boneyard, yo. AJ Styles versus Undertaker 
in the Boneyard match. There's two stories at play here, which I'll explain if, if you don't remember or if you've never seen it before. But if you have, oh, you know we're in for a, a manly good time. But yeah, two stories at play. The storyline story, the kayfabe stuff, and then what's going on behind the scenes to make this match happen. So Undertaker had been interfering in AJ Styles matches and costing him. This angered Styles uh, and he said, why do you even keep showing up Undertaker? You've lost it. Why don't you just retire? In fact, I'm going to bury you like you should bury your career in a boneyard match. I have to question the strategy of AJ Styles here because at the time he made the challenge and, and introduced us to this stipulation, we didn't know the specifics of what the boneyard match was, but even without that knowledge, Sounds very Undertaker, doesn't it? Sounds like it would favor the dead man, the Boneyard match. I'm not thinking that's a signature AJ Styles match type, no. I'm thinking that's prime Mark Calloway business. Like challenge him to a ladder match, AJ, or challenge him to uh, like a three hour long Iron Man match, or challenge him to Elevation X so far up in the sky. But no, it's the Boneyard uh, Taker obviously accepts. And now let's take a look at, at the real kind of story behind the scenes. So by 2020, Undertaker's ability had kind of largely deserted him. Not his fault at all. Father Time catches up with absolutely everybody. But it was becoming really apparent during these later matches in his career, especially the one against Goldberg at Super Showdown 2019. And Undertaker's kind of at this, at this time in his career searching for a retirement match that will be satisfactory, that won't tarnish his legacy, and that will let him have a big nice send off, uh, despite his waning abilities. So if there was one person who was maybe happy that WrestleMania 36 is gonna take place, you know, in front of no fans, it may well have been Undertaker. That's because he could have this last match in a, in an, in a really controlled environment and could ensure that he gets given the send off his career deserves. Uh, not just that, but WWE went above and beyond here, basically making a mini movie of this fight between Undertaker and AJ Styles in this external location in the Boneyard. So let's go through it right now. Oh, it's cheesy, but it's it's fun as well, I suppose. Listen, I have a, I have a confession to make, right? At the time in 2020, I didn't really like this very much, but I saw the reaction online and I was too scared. I was too much of a coward, right, to admit that I wasn't really feeling the Boneyard match. So um, that's my confession. There we go. I, I didn't really like it. Watched it back for this video, found it a good comedy match. Like, I don't know. I know people think it's awesome and stuff and fair play to you. I think it's okay. Let's just, let's look at what happens. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. So we have a few establishing shots of the Boneyard. A spooky hearse pulls up while Undertaker's music plays, but just kidding, cause it's AJ Styles. Way little rascal. So what's Undertaker's entrance gonna be? Why Metallica's Now That We're Dead plays, I don't know that, is that a big one? I know it went to Sun Man. And here comes our dad, The Undertaker, on his cool motorbike. Yes, he would go. Come on, dad. Styles talks trash to Taker and says, I didn't think you would show up. And Undertaker goes, yep. And this, <laughs> this match is really Southern. Cormac McCarthy could have written this match. AJ says, does Michelle know that you're out this late? And Taker goes, I'm pretty sure if you listen closely, right? So AJ says that, does, does Michelle, does your wife know you're out this late? I think Taker's reply is, yep, yeah, she does. <laughs> Brilliant. Taker beats AJ round. He's, he's dominating early on. He's throwing him into the side of the hearse. One of the windows gets smashed. It's, it's Grizzly Undertaker stuff. And by the way, I should point out, obviously, this is not Dead Man Undertaker. This is something more akin to the American Badass. AJ though takes control with a low blow and tries to knock Undertaker into the nearby open grave. Um, the rules of the match are never made explicitly clear, but the winner is the one who can get his opponent in the grave and fill it in. Like it's buried alive rules basically. Taker fights back, he gets Styles in the grave, but just when it looks as though he's about to fill it in and win the match, we hear a voice from off camera saying, hey dead man. <laughs> and it's, oh, it's Gallows and Anderson, it's the boys. Not just that, but Gallows and Anderson have a team of druids with them and they surround Undertaker and he goes, well, we're, we're gonna do this. And he beats them all up with ease because he's the toughest wrestler ever. And then Gallows and Anderson try and beat him up, but he beats them up with ease. But then AJ Styles comes back and turns the tables with, I think it's like a sheet of cement or something, smashes it over Undertaker's back. Talking about the match, like it's a real fight that happened for some reason. And then he dies and then he smashed it over his back. <laughs> it's real to me, damn it. Styles beats Taker down for ages and tackles him through a fence and Undertaker's done for. He's like lying up against a wall. He's wheezing and breathing heavily and crawling round and AJ's like, yeah, you're done. And, it, and Undertaker's like, <gasps> and I'm like, oh my God, the Undertaker's gonna die. 
again, because he's a zombie. AJ hits Taker with a shovel. Taker falls into the open grave. AJ gets up on a nearby, uh, like a tractor or a JCP. He's getting ready to fill the grave in but then he forgets one crucial thing. He should have read the scouting report on Undertaker, because as we all know, Taker is magical and has somehow teleported behind him in the tractor. AJ runs away, climbing a ladder onto a nearby rooftop. Undertaker follows him and summons fire. Gallows and Anderson also climb up to try and help AJ. Uh, Gallows gets thrown off the roof, presumably to his death. Anderson gets hit with a tombstone, and as he's getting held mid-move, we see that he's wearing Calvin Klein's, which, I'll be honest, kind of took me out of the gritty Western old-school setting. Got my Calvin's on, I'm ready to fight. Taker choke slams AJ off the roof into like a wooden board below, and then he climbs down, AJ's done, he's finished. I hit my, did that come through? I hit my elbow on the, but I know sold it. You see how, see how tough I am? I could be in the boneyard, Taker, if you need a tag partner next time. Yeah, AJ's done, Taker climbs down, uh, Taker climbs down, grabs him, and AJ's like begging. He's like, no, don't bury me, please, don't bury me. And Taker's like, come on, go out like, he says, go out like a man. What does that mean? Oh yeah, let me kill you. No. Taker then changes his mind and says, oh, I'm not gonna bury you. You put up a hell of a fight. You fought your ass off, kid. And then Taker turns to walk away and then he turns back and goes, this is Sparta. Well, he might as well say that because he kicks AJ who flies back into the grave and Taker's definitely gonna win. And there's no more twists actually, Taker does win. He uses the tractor to fill the grave up with soil uh, and then he gets down and removes a cover from the headstone uh, next to the grave, which he's already, this is the twist you see, he knew he was gonna win and he's prepared a headstone that says AJ Styles, whatever year he was born, 2020. And um, Taker knew, man, he was, conf he was a confident boy. We also get the classic shot of AJ's gloved hand sticking up from out of the ground, which is really silly, but I don't blame them at all for including it because that's the sort of idea that whoever thought of that should get a raise. That's the sort of idea that once you think of it, you can't not include it, it's too good. Taker gets on his bike and raises his arm and goes, yeah, and the, the, his symbol, his logo appears on the building behind him in lights beams and the Metallica song kicks back in and he, he rides off into the night and that's the last match of The Undertaker's career and he's done it, he's bloody won. Please, if you are watching this, and I don't know if there'll be anybody, but if any of you have never seen this match before, let me, before you immediately go and watch it, of course, let me know what you thought just from my description in the comments below, but I don't know if there'll be anyone, but guys, if there's someone who's never seen it, imagine how confused they'll be. But really, that's what wrestling's all about. None of this Mizawa bollocks, no CM Punk versus Samoa Joe, no Brian Danielson versus Kenta, no Kawada, Brett the Hitman, no, Taker, Southernness, Texas, motorbikes, rock and roll, yes. It's pure middle-aged man wish fulfillment from The Undertaker, but fair play to him, because in a weird little way, sort of is entertaining, isn't it? And looking back, maybe maybe my opinion of it is kinder nowadays than it was back then, my little secret negative opinion of this Boneyard match, but I, th I, th I, th I thought it was all right. I thought it was all right. Maybe because it was a, the lockdown mania. If this had happened at the end of a normal WrestleMania with a live crowd, I'd have thought, what the hell is going on? But for the time and for the show, fair enough. Also, it's worth mentioning, AJ would come back from this like a month later, which is a pretty quick recovery time from death. So respect where it's due there to Mr. Styles. Uh, right, that's the end of night one. And now it's time for night two. So yes, it's time for part two of the video. I, I, you might have guessed, I'm recording this on a different day, different t-shirt, whoa. I, I mentioned this to two separate people actually, and they both went, ooh, costume change, like it was really exciting. I did it, it's, this, isn't, this isn't the Oscars or the Brit Awards. Do they do costume changes at the Oscars? I guess, I don't know. The show starts with another Stephanie McMahon intro, different one to last time, and then uh, the same exact video package from night one. Not just the same like Jack Sparrow impersonator, not just the same themes, exactly the same video package, like same script, same imagery. It's just exactly the same, so there's nothing new to report here. So we'll just get straight to the action. Ooh, I'm blinded by the lights. <laughs> Elongated that last note far too much. Here's Gronk with another hype host intro from the platform 
platform and we're straight into our first match which is for the NXT Women's Championship. Rhea Ripley the champion defending against the Royal Rumble winner Charlotte Flair. Charlotte challenging unconventionally the NXT champion. Very interesting. Charlotte is outwitting Rhea early on. She's ducking her grapple attempt. She's targeting the knee. She's even taunting her, saying, this is your women's champion, NXT. And you might be thinking, well, yes, that's a classic storytelling device. That's really good. We're setting up Rhea overcoming this more experienced opponent of hers who's being really arrogant and cocky. And that's a good story. And I agree with you. That, that would have been nice. Rhea goes for the Riptide early on, gets it as well, and Charlotte kicks out, but it's still quite a surprise to see it so early on in the match. And this leads to Rhea being on top for a while, but the wily veteran Charlotte works her way back into it, and again, she's just relentless with the trash talk. You're rubbish, you, Rhea, is what she's kind of, is the gist of what she's saying. And the match settles into this sort of back and forth rhythm. It's quite a long match as well, about 20 minutes long. You've got Charlotte kind of being on top of the action, but Rhea coming back and firing up occasionally, and they're, they're seesawing back and forth. But one common theme is that Charlotte is always going back to that leg of Rhea Ripley, softening her up for the figure eight later on, if she gets it. Rhea gets her submission, the prison trap, but Charlotte gets out of it. Rhea, for her part, survives the spear. She also reverses a figure four leg lock attempt into a roll up for two. Then Charlotte gets the figure four, bridges into the figure eight, Rhea taps, match is over. Char Charlotte's the new NXT Women's Champion, what? Right, let's break this down then. Let's look at the whole match from a zoomed out perspective. Uh, Charlotte Flair spent the whole match saying that she was better than Rhea Ripley and then proved that she was correct. Right. So like this was a good match, but the finish really wasn't received well then and certainly hasn't aged well now. Look at Rhea Ripley now, how dominant she is and everything. Uh, so maybe it wasn't actually a good match because endings do matter. Imagine if The Godfather had ended with Al Pacino doing a little dance and singing Party Rock Anthem by LMFAO. Would it still be regarded as a classic then? Oh, maybe. But yeah, I didn't like it. Like, the work was good, but the, the booking decision was a baffling one. Thankfully, Rhea has overcome that, obviously, in the modern age. Uh, now, we are on to match number two. Alistair Black versus Bobby Lashley. Lana edition. Remember when Lana was his manager? And kayfabe wife? Weird time. This one is a contrast, a clash of styles. You've got, obviously, Alistair Black. He's a martial arts guy. He's finding his range. Papa, kicks and stuff. Lashley, slammy, slammy, slam. He's a big, strong wrestler man. Uh, another contrast between the two. Sometimes, not always, sometimes Lashley loses wrestling matches. Oh, a cheeky one from me there. Ooh. Again, the action in this one, very solid indeed. Alistair Black misses a moonsault to the outside, but lands on his feet very impressively. He turns around straight into a very nice overhead belly-to-belly -belly suplex from Lashley. Good stuff. Good wrestling. Lashley kind of dominates this one from this point onwards until Black reverses a spear attempt with a big knee. Kia! <laughs> From there, uh, Alistair Black's just on a roll. He nails the moonsault this time. Back in the ring does his drop down, leg sweepy, very low to the ground kind of thing. Uh, but Lashley fights back into it, sets him up for the Dominator. And this is when Lana makes what I'd like to call a tactical error. And we've all been there on the verge of victory. We've all made a mistake in a crucial moment. We've all made it to the Super Bowl and been leading at halftime. And then instead of just running the ball and killing the clock for the rest of the game, for some reason we decide to now establish a passing game. I don't know why you would possibly do that in the Super Bowl, the grandest stage of them all, but it happens. Sorry to the fans of the Atlanta Falcons and the San Francisco 49ers. And the Seattle Seahawks, kind of. That was slightly different circumstances. Look at me. Look at my NFL knowledge. Call me Jackie National Football League. That's my new name. Anyway, back to Lana. She gets on the apron. Bobby's got Alistair Black beat. He's got him up for the Dominator. Lana goes, no. She's really shouting a lot as well. She's really angry for some reason. She's like, no, 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 no. Spear him, spear him, spear him. Lashley does what she says. He drops Alistair Black to the canvas, sets up instead for the spear inevitably runs straight into the black mass. One, two, three, Alistair Black wins. Lana has cost Lashley the match. And I don't mind this on the surface. Like, yeah, obviously the story they're trying to tell here is that Lana has cost Bobby Lashley the match and it's gonna lead to them parting ways uh, at some point in the near future. But here, I think it just made them look really stupid. Like, Lana looks really stupid for suggesting this. Lashley looks really stupid for going along with her recommendation because it doesn't make any sense. Why is she so against him hitting the Dominator and then the Spear, for example? What a revolutionary idea, but no, she's like, not that move, this one. And it just led to an instant defeat. Anyway, they end up getting divorced. Not in real life, but story. Oh, I've just remembered that news. Oh, 
Backstage, Kayla is interviewing Sasha Banks and the reigning SmackDown Women's Champion, Bailey, who is defending her title against four other women later on. One of them, Sasha, uh-oh. Bailey says everyone's overreacting, they're still best friends, nothing's gonna come between them in this match and it's all gonna be fine. Then Kayla does, I think, an excellent bit of journalism here because Bailey storms off, Sasha's about to leave with her, but Kayla goes, no, one second, Sasha, let me just get your thoughts on this individually. I'm like, that is Journalism 101, Kayla. Yes, journalist of the show. But Sasha doesn't really give an answer. She's kind of just all vague and she says, we'll just have to wait and see what happens. Ooh, building intrigue, nice. So night two, apart from that initial booking decision, quite sensible. Oh, and the Lana stuff. Okay, the okay, the start of things is good in, on night two so far, but not the yet. Kind of like this sentence. Johnny Caruso's up on the platform interviewing Gronk. He's jiving, he's moving, he's pumping his fist. Does he ever stop? Like, Gronk, calm down, seriously, mate. Gronk says, uh, you know what, Charlie? I've won three major titles in my life. Uh, and, and you know what? That's all in the past because tonight, I wouldn't mind becoming 24-7 champion by end of the tonight. By end of the tonight. That's word for word what he said. By end of the tonight. And you might think, oh, Jack, you're being harsh. He's not, you know, he's not a wrestler. He's not used to, you know, cutting promos. This wasn't live. That means this, this was the best take they could possibly get by end of the tonight. Next up, I mean, come on, one of the best stories ever told in wrestling. I don't even think I'm joking. Otis versus Dolph Ziggler for the love of Mandy Rose. Unbelievable scenes, really good. I'll give you a quick little recap of the storyline in case you weren't watching at the time. If you weren't, you are in for a treat. Um, go back and watch it, it's unbelievable. Otis is in love with Mandy and hey, guess what? She likes him too and they set up a little date and it all looks like it's going well. But the date gets sabotaged by an unknown person who texts Otis off Mandy's phone saying, hey, I'm running a bit late for our date, except she isn't actually running late. So Otis accidentally stands Mandy up at the restaurant. By the time he finally gets, I'm getting choked up. It's so emotional. By the time he finally gets there, Dolph Ziggler's taking his place. Then things go a bit weird. It's not a perfect story, all right? There's some weirdness in it, I guess. A mysterious hacker reveals on an episode of the televised product that it was actually Mandy Rowe's tag team partner and best friend Sonya Deville who was the one who texted Otis off her phone sabotaging the date. Why, Sonya? Why? Um, this means that Sonya is now in Dolph Ziggler's corner uh, and Otis is hungry for revenge. What's Mandy going to do? That's the big question. Is she going to side with Otis or is she going to break his heart and side with Dolph? Apart from the hacker stuff, <laughs> which is a bit left field, classic, simple storytelling, good guy, bad guy, and everybody got really emotionally invested because Otis is such a naturally lovable babyface. Also, right, uh, the hacker was eventually revealed to be Mustafa Ali, who would become obviously the leader of this new Retribution stable who are tearing stuff up in WWE. But could it be argued that the reason Retribution began in the first place was to bring justice to Otis? That's a weird one. Otis comes out so angry and charges the ring. Ziggler bails, but before he bailed for a second, I thought this was going to be like Kensa Kabashi versus Kensuke Sasaki in 2005. Just so many chops, just so many. Imagine if it had been. What we do get is still pretty good. Uh, it's a simple story done really, really well. Uh, emotional stakes, all the rest of it. And even though it's nothing complicated, it doesn't need to be. And if you weren't following WWE in 2020, I should emphasize everybody wanted Otis desperately to win here. And there was a sense of like trepidation as well, because obviously Vince McMahon's in control. He hates giving wrestling fans what they want. And we all wanted this so much. So there wasn't, this wasn't like a certain Otis victory as much as it should have been. It was genuinely one of the most anticipated matches across both nights. Anyway, Ziggler lands a super kick early. Otis is all woozy. It's like, no, Otis, come on. You've got to survive. He fires back up. I imagine everybody sat at home is like, come on, Otis, come on soon. I love this, to be fair. Later on, Otis goes for the caterpillar, but oh, Sonya Deville gets on the apron, distracts the referee, which somehow also distracts Otis. Like he doesn't just hit the move, Otis. She's not stopping you from doing that. Ziggler's there for you. But no, Otis instead complains and says, what's she doing on the apron? Low blow from Dolph Ziggler. Actually, it was a kick, kicking low blow by Dolph Ziggler. And it looks like he's going to win. But just when it looks like all is lost, hang on, hark, what's that music? M Mandy. Here comes Mandy Rose. Whose side is she on? She's immediately on Otis's side. Big slap to Sonya. De there we go. Big slap to Sonya Deville at the bottom of the ramp. She gets in the ring. Ref is still distracted. Now checking on Sonya. Low blow to Dolph Ziggler. <sighs> Genuinely really exciting. It's like when Magnum TA fired up on Tully Blanchard in 1985. I've not watched that match for a long time. I imagine there's a fire up spot. There must be at some point, right? 
Otis does now get the caterpillar going. He, he j just before he hits the elbow drop, he does like this noise. He goes like, "Shit!" <laughs> it's a weird "shit," and then, <laughs> but it's but it's awesome. Whatever it means, big elbow drop lands it. One, two, three. Otis beats Dolph Ziggler. It's the happiest of endings. He and Mandy share a lovely little kissy wissy, and honestly, if there's any moment of WrestleMania 36 that deserved a live crowd, apart from maybe the main event of night two, which we'll talk about later on, but if there was any other moment, oh, it was this one. This would have been amazing with a live audience. Now we're going from a match that was just a lovely, simple, uncomplicated piece of perfection to kind of the opposite. So we're going from a lovely glass of ice cool lemonade on a hot summer's day, just what you need, to a match that was like a massive hot Sunday roast dinner on a hot summer's day. Not quite what you need. And there's extra potatoes and gravy and all that, and which nice sometimes, not on a hot summer's day. And you've got to eat it outside and there's flies everywhere. Oh, terrible. It's the last man standing match between Edge and Randall Keith Orton. The story here is that obviously Edge made this huge stunning return at the 2020 Royal Rumble. Everybody was elated by this. It's possible it's probably the best return in Royal Rumble history. But then Orton turned on him shortly afterwards and even RKO'd Beth Phoenix in the build up to this, aiming to send Edge back into retirement. So that's the story here and Edge is really hungry to get vengeance. Long drawn out vengeance as it turns out. This match went just over, I think, 37 minutes long, making it still, I believe at the time of recording, the second longest match in WrestleMania history. Second only to, obviously, the hour-long Iron Man match between Bret and Sean at WrestleMania 12. And that Iron Man match is very polarizing. Some people don't like it at all. Some people do. Uh, I don't know many people who are fans of this Last Man Standing match. Edge comes out first, uh, Orton's music hits, but he doesn't come out because he's a slippery snake. Uh, Edge is like, where is he? He's obviously behind him, Randy slides in the ring, RKO, and we start the match off with, out of nowhere, a finishing maneuver. And we actually see in the replay that Randall got himself to ringside by disguising as a cameraman. Oh, <laughs> delightfully devilish, Seymour. Edge gets slowly to his feet, but he's woozy. He misses a wild right hand. Another RKO instantly. And remember, this is last man standing rules. And Edge looks like he might lose already, but he, he just beats the count. Orton blasts Edge with a camera, knocking him into the, the crowd barricade. I was going to say the front row, but obviously no crowd. Uh, he beats the count again, and they brawl into the backstage area of the performance center. Uh, the, they, they really do, for a long time, do this also. They fight into the gym, uh, where Orton chokes Edge with a... I don't even know what it is. It's like pull down, is it for pull-downs? Is it for tricep stuff? It's for your muscles. It's for some... Some of your muscles, uh, Orton chokes Edge with that. Orton then picks up a plate from a nearby barbell. Uh, he's about to use it, but Edge kicks it into him and takes control of the match. And this is where we get a really common theme in this match, which is a lot of selling, a lot of lying around, a lot of grunting and panting. And, uh, uh, it's like the Ulysses of wrestling matches. Shout out my boy James Joyce. I've literally never read a James Joyce novel, but I will. I will read Ulysses and I'll give you my thoughts when I'm about 50. Edge sits Orton in a steel chair, gets on like the pull-up bar, swings like a little boy and kind of lands, like kind of sits on him, but hard. And Orton's down. More panting, more selling. Ugh. Ugh. Orton then tries to run Edge over with one of those sleds, one of those weighted sleds that the gym goers use, but Edge gets out the way just in time. And they end up brawling into the red corridor, not the red corridor. Eventually, they end up brawling into like a big boardroom, like a big meeting room. Edge lays Orton on the big long table in the middle, then notices there's like a grate above holding the lights, uh, and he gets on it. And <laughs> I've no doubt that this did hurt and was tricky to do, but it was kind of unintentionally funny at the same time. Edge clings onto it like a, like a scuzzy 80s Spider-Man, and then drops just a little way, just a little elbow drop. Again, no doubt that it hurt. Um, it did look a bit silly. And the match is going on and on and on. It's starting to drag. Uh, so long, in fact, that I've had to change my t-shirt again because the match is so long. That was, a, um, that was a joke suggested by Luke, the editor of this video, of course. Uh, and I've, I've accepted that suggestion because it's a good joke. It refers to the match that I'm talking about. And it makes sense. You know, it's a traditional gag. Whereas my jokes kind of often go like... Bleh. Yeah, and I just sort of peter out towards the end. I don't know. Hmm. 
Anyway, Edge and Orton keep brawling. They keep brawling. They end up in the interview bit of the venue. Orton finds a bottle of water and just goes, splish. And, and it's really hot. At this point, I notice the vibe's a bit weird, right? It's a bit muted. And I notice that maybe a big part of that is that the announced team are treating it kind of like a golf tournament. They're like, yes, and now we see Edge and Orton arrive at this part of the venue. Oh, Edge is setting up for a move. And now Orton's counted that there. Very good. Anyway, they end up in the warehouse part of the venue and uh, Edge climbs up a scaffold up to a little platform and puts Randy through a table with a big elbow drop. Yeah. They head up onto a pickup truck. Orton hits the draping DDT onto like the flatbed bit of the truck. And in the background, we get a lovely shot here of a bigger production truck, like a massive 18-wheeler in the background with the NXT logo plastered all across it. A kind of ironic reminder of what we could be watching instead. We are wild and young. That's, I've, I mention it all the time, best theme tune in the business ever. Bring it back. They head up onto the big truck, the NXT truck, uh, right on the roof of it. Uh, Edge is set up for the punt kick by Randy, but he counters it into a spear. Yes, wild and young. Edge goes for another spear, but this time Randy counters it with an RKO out of nowhere, wild and young. Randy fetches a pair of chairs and he's setting Edge up for that concerto. He goes for it, but Edge is up and grabs him in a choke and chokes the Viper out and lays him down onto one of the chairs, picks up the other one, right? He's setting up for the concerto. He looks at Randy, cries, I guess to boost his attack, like a, like a, like a growl in Pokemon, and then hits the concerto, and that's finally the end of the match Edge wins. Now, the way I've laid the match out there might sound quite exciting, because I've mentioned like all the high spots, all the big moments, right? But you've got to remember that this was, this was glued together by miles and miles of just walk over here, Right hand, bang your head into the thing. Oh, you've beat the count at nine. Right hand, bang your, you, you've you beaten the count this time. Right hand. The pair would obviously go on to have a rematch at Backlash, uh, which was billed as the greatest match of all time uh, before it had happened. But to be fair to them, the balls on these guys, it went even longer than this one under a normal single stipulation and turned out better, much better. Don't ask me how it was better. It's just one of those cosmic mysteries of the universe. But it, it actually was, I was like, four, how, how long was it? 44 minutes. We cut back to the arena and Mojo Rawley's being chased by wrestlers who want to get their hands on his 24 seven title. And oh my God, one of them is literally Von Wagner. Mojo gets swamped by these NXT sort of performance center guys and he's getting beaten down. But look, who's that up on the platform? It's Gronk who smiles like a Labrador and then leaps off the platform onto everybody below, covers Mojo and becomes 24 seven champion. Then lays in a few kicks for no reason, just to people on the floor and then runs off into the night with the 24 seven belt. Well done Gronk. It's, uh, it's, it's worked out in the end, hasn't it for you, my friend? I think he'd go on to win like another Super Bowl after this, but not as big a deal as the 24-7 belt. Next up, the Raw Tag Team title match. It's the Street Profits defending against those two classic best friends. They're thick as thieves. Look back on like all the great tag teams of history, the Brain Busters, Legion of Doom, Midnight Express, Edge and Christian, the Hardys, Austin Theory, and Angel Garza. They've always been bezzy mates. They're, they're homies. Andrade got injured, so Theory had to replace him quite quite later on in the build. In fact, there's another uh, kind of change to the card that we have to talk about at this point, because I think it was never officially announced, but reportedly around this time, they were setting up for a US title match between Rey Mysterio and Andrade. Then Rey got put into precautionary quarantine, and then I, I guess Andrade got shifted into this tag title match, and then he missed out, and then had to be replaced there as well. So lots of moving parts, but they, they got a card together in the end. The heels are in control early in this one. Angel builds up ahead of steam, and then, uh, well, that's more of a butterfly. Uh, and then he does his signature taunt, which is, of course, ripping his pants off. Woohoo! Um, no, yeah, I am excited about that. Yes, woohoo. Ford gets the hot tag and then screams, WrestleMania! And then, <laughs> just in case we didn't know, then he dives to the outside, taking out not only one of his opponents, but his own tag partner as well. He's, he's crazy. Garza then hits a big moonsault to the outside, ends up on the ramp, and it, the ramp says WrestleMania, and he sees that, and he goes, This is WrestleMania! I'm like, yeah, thank you, we've just, yeah, uh-huh. 
Theory and Dawkins end up as the legal men in the match. Dawkins is hit by Theory's finisher. Theory makes the cover, but here comes Montez springboarding in to break it up. Uh, Dawkins rolls over, makes the cover. One, two, three, and the champions retain. The heels try to ruin the selly of the, of the baby faces by getting involved and beating them down. Zelina Vega comes in to join in as well. But here comes Bianca Belair to save the day. Um, she celebrates with the Street Profits, and that's all she would do on this year's WrestleMania. Obviously, the next year, WrestleMania 37, would be a lot better for her. Who's that? Way up on the Gronk balcony. It's Ura Ura! It's Tyus O'Neill. He's the replacement host, he explains, and he can't wait for the rest of tonight's action. By this late stage in the game, I would have just said, oh, do we need a host for the rest of the show? But I like Tyus, so I can't complain too much. He just seems like a good guy, doesn't he? Next up, as we learned earlier on, a five-way elimination rules match for the SmackDown Women's Championship. Bailey defending not only against her best friend, Sasha Banks, what's going to happen there, but also against Lacey Evans, Naomi, and Tamina. And I specifically remember Tamina's involvement because I remember at the time, old Ross was very, very excited. It would not pan out well for him or for Tamina. No! Also, Dana Brooke was meant to be involved in this match, but had to quarantine. I assume it would have just been a six-way match rather than a five-way, but I don't actually know. During Bailey's entrance, we get a wonderful example of what I like to call cinematography. Oh, look at that image there. Bailey on the apron, Sasha looking on from behind. What's going to happen between these two friends? It's cinema. It's the movies. In fact, this shot is probably up there with my five favorite shots in cinema history. Oh God, I'm gonna have to think of those now, right? Here we go. Um, here are my five favorite shots in cinema history. Um, number one, that one from Fargo, from above the car in the snow. That's one, come on, Jack. Number two, um, Mission Impossible one, the original, where Tom Cruise is like hanging above the, whoa, don't touch the floor. That's a good shot. Christ, number three, Sasha Banks and Bailey, WrestleMania 36. Cheap one, but let's let's keep going. Number four, Randy Orton and Edge, the, the DDT on the truck with the, the NXT one in the back. Again, uh, it's a WrestleMania 36 one, yes. And finally, number five, um, the astronaut walking down the corridor. You know, is it from 2001 A Space Odyssey? I think it is. I've never seen it. That's my five favorite shots in cinema history. You're welcome. Oh yeah, right, the match. So everyone teams up on Tamina to start the bout because she's the biggest and the strongest and she's the biggest threat. She fights back a bit, then gets taken out again. Sasha and Bailey are very much working together. Uh, the match goes on for a while with Tamina recovering on the outside. Then she comes back in and just steamrolls everyone. It all breaks down and then we get a Team Bad reunion. Remember Team Bad? Michael Cole remembers and he actually says on commentary, oh, these three women were actually a, a pretty big part of the women's revolution and he talks about it like it's some like distant world war ii memory or something like you might not remember this guys but years ago the women weren't booked very equally at all but we sorted all that out you probably don't remember and uh, now yeah it's all good all three of the former members of team bad do their taunt which remember say it with me if you do they all put their hands in the middle and go a unity there are going to be people at home who did that i know there will be not many of you but if you were one of the ones who did that I see you. I've got I've got your back. Anyway, the taunt doesn't work very well for Sasha because she does it and then just gets super kicked. Wow, yes, like that, that hard or harder by Tamina. But it's bad news for Tamina in the end because everybody takes turns hitting aerial moves on her and then they all pile on top and get the win. She uh, get the win. She's eliminated from the match. You know what I mean? The match continues and there's only four left. Bailey and Sasha continue to work together. They isolate Naomi, uh, and Naomi tries to fight bravely back. She builds up a little bit of a head of steam, but eventually falls victim to that goddamn numbers game, and she has to tap out to the bank's statement. Two down. Now we get Sasha and Bailey teaming up against the last remaining babyface, Lacey Evans, but Lacey forces a miscommunication, and Bailey accidentally knees Sasha in the head. Oh no. Once Sasha has recovered on the outside, she grabs Bailey and goes, what the hell? It's time for some acting. She goes, what the hell? And Bailey goes, dude, it wasn't my fault. And Sasha goes, I've always had your back. Now that's not true now, Sasha, is it? That's a lie. I remember NXT. You were horrible to her. Well then, young. Bailey pleads her case and says, no, like Sasha, I'm still loyal to you. And then 
absolutely 100% proves that she's telling the truth because Lacey Evans comes in with just a massive right hand because her finisher at the time was the women's right, which sounds silly because it was just a huge right hand, but it was actually she was actually really good at it in my opinion. Um, Bailey shoves Sasha out the way, so Lacey kind of cunningly just does it again, and this time clocks Sasha, pins her, and uh, it's down to Lacey and Bailey. Now we're into the final stage of the match. Bailey ties Lacey to the tag rope in one of the corners so she can beat her down for a while. It doesn't last forever, but Lacey gets free. It was still quite a nice, I think a unique heel spot in the match. Lacey fights back, but then Sasha comes back in. She's already been eliminated, but I guess there's no DQs in a, in a multi-woman match, with, even if it is elimination rules and we're down to the last two. I kind of agree with the ref's call, I suppose. Anyway, Sasha hits the... I'm treating it like it's real. It's obviously not. Sasha hits the bank statement, and Lacey is at a severe disadvantage now. Bailey hits the rose plant, pins Lacey, and retains the SmackDown Women's title. And after the seeds were sown for what was seemingly the most obvious breakup angle I've ever seen, they didn't turn on each other. So that was genuinely a shocking twist. They would obviously, they would break up later on down the line. Anyway, the next match, it's time for the Firefly Funhouse match between uh, The Fiend, Bray Wyatt, and John Cena. And like the Boneyard, the Boneyard, the Boneyard match on night one, um, this is a cinematic match, and I, I do prefer this one. Um, I think that it takes itself far less seriously. Obviously, the Boneyard was so serious. Guitars and metal and fire and motorbikes, whereas this one is far more self-aware and I think has become quite poignant, obviously, in the wake of Bray's sad passing. Uh, it's become quite a nice reminder of his very unique creativity. And John Cena, fair play to him, he is fully up for it. Like, you can tell he's greenlit a lot of stuff in this and he is fully along for the ride. And it's it's for the benefit of the match, or the match, like the, the cinematic experience, I guess. It starts with Cena making his entrance into the empty arena and doing kind of a sheepish, like, Oh, oh, there's no one here. Oh, and I'm like, John, you're like the 20th wrestler we've seen over the course of the two nights. This is very main character syndrome, I'm afraid. Cena goes, welcome to WrestleMania. And then the feed cuts and we get the Bray Wyatt static and everything. And then we're with Bray in the Firefly Funhouse. And Wyatt says, John, you're about to face your most dangerous opponent yet yourself. And this is going to be like an examination of Cena's inner psyche. We cut to Cena in a dark room where he is confronted by the Vince McMahon puppet, which has devil horns. It's aged very uncomfortably, yes. Um, but thankfully, the puppet doesn't feature too heavily in this whole thing. The puppet asks Cena if he has enough ruthless aggression. And now we get a recreation of Cena's kind of infamous moment uh, on SmackDown where he was an unknown and he came out and confronted Kurt Angle. Except Bray is playing the role of Kurt. He's cutting his promo word for word. Cena is playing, obviously, the role of himself, but in old attire. Uh, and we even get the SmackDown fist. Huge pop for that. Cena keeps trying to slap Bray and say, you know, he goes ruthless aggression like he did to Kurt and tries to slap him. Bray just keeps ducking it. He ducks it so many times that at one point he even sings to Cena and goes, you can look, but you can't touch. Obviously, Cena's ex being Nikki Bella. This, I think, happened quite soon after their breakup. And I remember at the time when he said it, Bray, I remember going like, whoa, like I was quite taken aback. Alone, alone in my bedroom at home, like many of us. But still, I was like, oh. <laughs> Cena chases Bray out of the arena and now we cut to the 80s. We get Saturday night's main event intro that, that's playing. Uh, Bray is cutting an old school ladies promo and introduces his tag team partner, Johnny Largemeat. And here's Cena and they're all very muscly and raw and like 80s and over the top. And Cena's got two dumbbells and just does like a million bicep curls and it's, it's really... Oh, it's manly. And it's all ironic, obviously. Bray says, you know what? Talent doesn't matter as long as you've got big muscles, <laughs> which my partner has. And like, it's a common criticism of Cena, I guess. It's a good bit. The, the Cena's still doing the bicep curls. There's 80s music playing in the background and everything. But now we cut to the next bit and Cena's in his Doctor of Thugonomics gear. A word life. Does he do that with his pinkies? Yes, I believe so. Cena spits some bars a Bray Wyatt, but like each punchline is met with sound effects like crickets chirping or boo. And Cena looks uncomfortable. Bray cuts a promo in response to Cena and says, you're a bully, John. You're a horrible person and you, you laugh at other people's weaknesses. Cena then charges at Bray who teleports behind him and clocks Cena with John's own signature chain. Now we cut to maybe my favorite bit of the whole thing, which is a vignette 
about their previous match at WrestleMania 30 because it's got references like Bray's doing a voiceover over the top of footage of what's going on uh, back at Mania 30. And it's kind of referred to, I think, that everybody wanted Bray to win that match. You know, Bray mentions the Fireflies and you ignored all their voices and everything. I thought it was really well done. Now we're back in the empty arena and uh, Bray offers Cena a chair just like he did at Mania 30. He kneels down and says, go on, John, hit me. Right the wrongs of six years ago and Cena swings the chair but Bray disappears. Now we get the bit that I think people might most remember from this because it was just such a striking visual. Um, first, actually, we get Bray cutting a, a sort of, uh, it's like an Eric Bischoff promo as he's about to introduce Hollywood Hulk Hogan. But instead, the heel that Bray brings out is, is John Cena in NWO gear. He's too sweeting. He's got the, the big gold belt, but spray painted and everything. It's, uh, it's interesting. And it's obviously a, a comment on the fact that for so many years, everybody's been saying, why don't they just turn Cena heel? Cena too sweet spray, but then changes his mind and beats him down. Uh, and then we get a montage, like with little clips of notable defeats from Cena's past against opponents that the internet crowd, I guess, probably enjoyed that he lost to, even if they were meant to be the heels or the, I guess not the ultra baby faces, at least like Cena. So for example, there's like, there's Edge, there's even, and this took me by surprise, for WWE in 2020, there's a little shot of CM Punk as well. Anyway, this is all like a thing going on in Cena's head. He snaps out of it and he's not beating down Bray anymore. He's just beating down Huskus, the puppet. Now it's time for the fiend to finally appear. Bray and his fiend persona who appears behind John Cena, uh, chokes him out with the mandible claw, sister Abigail, and while this is going on, we hear audio playing of a promo that Cena cut in the build to this very match. And in that promo, Cena said, uh, this match is going to end the most overhyped, uh, overrated superstar in WWE history, which at the time seemed like he was saying that very scathingly about Bray. But now in this context, it very much seems like it's about Cena himself. Um, Bray hits the sister Abigail. Cena, he covers him, makes the pinfall, and then Cena disappears. And that's it. And yeah, it's very interesting. And what better way to end things than with a hard cut back to the actual live performance center with Titus O'Neil just looking really confused into the camera. Yeah, fair enough. I guess, I guess he was needed after all as the replacement guest host. Yeah, I think this was, this whole thing, this whole Firefly Funhouse match, I guess, was, um, I think it was a risk that paid off. It, it was very well made in parts. It was very creative. And I think they addressed, or at least, at least acknowledged a lot of common criticisms aimed at Cena or the booking of Cena throughout his time in WWE, which is something I never thought I'd see. So at least we can say we got that. As I mentioned, it's also a, a very poignant reminder of Bray Wyatt's unique creativity as well. So for that reason, above all others, I am also glad that we've got this as like a permanent reminder of his legacy. It's not the only highlight of his career, obviously, but it's certainly one of the more unique ones. And now finally, we get the main event of WrestleMania 36. Brock Lesnar defending against the Royal Rumble winner, Drew McIntyre. And yes, of course, the most memorable thing about this match, we've got to just mention it right off the bat, is that more than anything, apart from maybe Otis and Ziggler, which is nearing it, I suppose, but no, seriously, apart from like anything else, this suffered the most from a lack of crowd. Um, not so much because of the style of the match, but because this was meant to be Drew's moment. But nowadays, in 2024, I don't really know how to feel about this now. Because on one hand, yes, this was Drew's moment. He was so over in the build to Mania, and he never got that moment. But also, on the positive side of things, it's provided his current character, as I recall this video, with tremendous bitterness and a tremendous heel motivation, which comes across so well on screen. So yeah, if you can't tell from what I've just said, Drew wins the title here, but it's a really short match, similar to Goldberg versus Braun from the night before. It's really blunt and to the point. It's longer than that one, but not by much. I think it's about like four and a half minutes long. So yeah, from the off, they're just spamming finishes and big signature moves. Drew connects with a Claymore early on. Uh, he goes for a second one, Brock avoids it. Few German suplexes, F5. Drew kicks out a one, another F5, and Drew kicks out a two this time. Then another F5, and again Drew kicks out a two. Drew slips out of a fourth F5 attempt, hits a Claymore, and a second one, and a third one, pins Brock, one, two, three, and becomes WWE Champion. And again, for reasons beyond anybody's control, it, it can't help but feel a little bit flat. And Drew's doing his best. He's like reaching out to the camera and saying, this is for all of you. And I get it, but it just, and again, it's nobody's fault, but it just doesn't quite, it doesn't quite become what it should be as a moment. But hey, he tried his best. Uh, and I think that might 
sum WrestleMania 36 up as like a microcosm of the whole show. A strangely hollow feeling that you can't ever quite fully block out of your brain, but they made the most of what they had. I mean, it's something we'll likely never see again in our lifetime. So on that side of things, I am kind of morbidly curiously glad that it happened in a weird way, that we got to see what a mania would look like with zero attendance. But on the other hand, it is very much something that I never want to see happen ever again. So yeah, that's it. That's re- Thank you, you know, thank you for watching. Oh, and we learn later on on Raw that there was a dark match after the show at WrestleMania 36, of course, because we'd learn that of all people, the big show would come out and challenge Drew to an immediate title shot. Drew obviously won that, uh, and we'd later see that match in full. But like, can you imagine if Big Show had won? Like, seriously. Maybe that's a good way to cap it off by mentioning a match that aired after the show that we didn't even see, and which actually was a longer match than the real main event of WrestleMania 36. That was weird, and this was a weird show. Thank you very much for watching this video. I've been Jack from Cultaholic. Thank you to Luke on the edit as always, and I hope you've enjoyed this bumper length edition of weirdest episodes. Enjoy WrestleMania 40 if you're watching this beforehand uh, and leave your thoughts and opinions in that comment section down below. Thanks once again and I'll see you very soon.